Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it. So take a look at our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, node balancers, and a 40 gigabit public network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale up. And for your tasks that need fast computations, such as training machine learning models and running your CI CD pipelines, they just launched dedicated CPU instances. And they've also got worldwide data centers, including a new one in Toronto and one opening in Mumbai at the end of the year. So go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E today, to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. You listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with the ways that Python is being used, including the latest in machine learning and data analysis. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Dataversity, and the Open Data Science Conference, with upcoming events including the O'Reilly AI Conference, the Strata Data Conference, and the combined events of the Data Architecture Summit and Graph Forum. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more and take advantage of our partner discounts when you register. And don't forget to visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Nicholas Tollervy about his recent work on Code Grades, a new effort that he is building to blend his backgrounds in music, education, and software to help teach kids of all ages how to program. So, Nicholas, can you start by introducing yourself? So, hello everybody. Uh, my name's Nicholas, and I'm a freelance Python software developer. Uh, but before I was a software developer, I was a classically trained musician and then a teacher. Um, and this will become relevant as I'm sure we go forward through the podcast. And for anybody who hasn't listened to your past interview on this show, can you remind us how you first got introduced to Python? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I went into software development after getting interested in open source technology, Linux. I taught myself a little bit of C. Um, and my first job was working with C Sharp. So my CV uh, was full of .NET related things. And I ended up working in an investment bank in the city of London. Whilst there working with a bunch of quants, they wanted to script a tool that I had written for them. And Iron Python was a thing back then in 2008. And uh, so I, I started to investigate Python, realized that this was... Uh, this is a good place to be, an interesting place to be, and made the transition into Python. And so now you have gone down the path of starting a new educational resource for people who want to get involved in programming. And I'm wondering if you can describe a bit about what the Code Grades platform is and your motivation for starting the project. Okay, so um, Code Grades is an experiment to help folks learn about programming um, and initially Python. Um, it's a sort of an exercise in digital empowerment in, in that sense. Um, and it's an experiment because its modus operandi um, is, is based upon aspects of music education uh, transplanted into the world of coding. Um, now, it remains to be seen if, if it will work, but, but I'm, helpful, I'm hopeful for a number of reasons. Um, so the first one is... Uh, well, coding is like music in that it's a long-term investment of time and effort, and it can also be a very abstract thing to do. And it also involves learning about a certain sort of a culture, such as um, in the case of music playing in a band or or in the case of coding, send, how to send a bug report that's useful to, uh, to a project on GitHub or something like that. Um, Another reason why I'm hopeful is that the, it, at least in the Western tradition of music education, uh, it's it's hundreds of years old, and I've been both on the receiving and giving end of this tradition. And uh, music education has developed a number of techniques and processes and cultural expectations uh, to address the problem of training folks in the complicated and long-term sort of uh, skill of uh, and social practice of making music, and so. My idea, um, this is how CoGrade sort of came about, uh, is, is the sort of typical lazy programmer outlook um, applied to coding education. And I asked myself, well, surely someone has thought about these sorts of problems before. And this led me to realize that a large part of my life, uh, both as a learner and professionally, has been in a world from which we can borrow, adopt and adapt educational practices, um, stuff from the from the music world. 
Um, so code grades is is a first step in this process. So um, you might ask yourself, well, what actually does code grades do? Well, um, it's very simple. Um, there are eight grades. Uh, to pass a grade, you present one of your own coding projects for one-to-one -one evaluation by a professional developer. And you also get asked to do some pair programming tasks at an appropriate sort of a level to where, to where you are as a programmer. And uh, this takes some time uh, to prepare for. Um, and, uh, and the actual grading itself can take anywhere between 20 minutes to an hour, depending on the level of the grade. Uh, and at the end, you get a mark with indications of what your various strengths and weaknesses are, along with uh, a written report about how you've done and sort of feedback uh, with suggestions and constructive criticism and encouragement. And obviously, grade one is easy. Um, and as the grades get higher, the scope and the requirements get more challenging um, until you get to grade eight, which is the highest grade. Um, everything to do with code grades is free, except for grading, which people will have to pay for because obviously people are giving up their time and uh, and, <laughs> and and need to be able to uh, earn a living and things. Um, and uh, I hope that um, if it's a success, that people who um, want to find some way of supporting themselves as free software developers, um, rather than having to go and get a gig at um, some megacorp turning red widgets blue, um, they can actually uh, perhaps work as uh, somebody who does um, the assessment, um, I call them code mentors, um, and, and earn some sort of a living that way to help them um, pay for their open source work. And uh, if uh, you're from uh, a Commonwealth country or East Asian country, you'll recognize what I've just described as the music grades system um, that we use. So there are eight music grades in the UK and uh, you start honking away on your trumpet at grade one uh, and eventually you get to grade eight and uh, you can, um, you, you're a very competent musician as a result. And it's also very similar to the belt system. Um, used in martial arts as well. So it's this sort of stepwise system that, uh, that that appears to work well in supporting folks who want to acquire a skill over a long, that, that requires long-term investment of time and effort. So that in a nutshell is, is code grades. So a lot of people have been able to learn programming and learn development in a variety of different ways and I'm wondering what you have found to be different in your experience of seeing the outcomes of those methodologies and maybe any experience that you've had as far as participating in any of those uh, learning systems and how you view the differences in your approach with code grades and some of the benefits and trade-offs that you see that would lead somebody to go down the code grades path versus some of the other ways that they might have approached it prior. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so uh, let's think. Um, when I learned to code when I was a kid, I was just experimenting and I was self-taught. And that takes a particular sort of a character or personality or situation. Life chances as well play a large part of this. Um, and so there are various ways uh, in which folks have tried to... Um, Teach coding. Um, I'll, I'll mention two now. Uh, the first one is is the code boot camp, and code grades, I guess, is a sort of anti code boot camp. Um, so, for those who aren't familiar with boot camps, um, companies will charge folks ten thousand dollars or more for three months uh, of, of coding boot camp, with the promise usually of employment. At the end of it, you can become a software developer if you. If you complete our three month um, boot camp, just pay us all the money. Now, this is good that they're trying to get people into uh, in, into coding. But, um, you know, ask yourself, uh, would you hire musicians to play at your wedding if they would just completed a three month boot camp? Um, I guess such musicians uh, and their audience have been sold a sort of a false promise in a sense. Uh, and I'm not saying that the folks who attend boot camps are not developers. I'm just saying that they're the sort of developer that you get after three months of intense cramming. Um, and that is perhaps what the problem is. 
uh, here. So uh, how is code grades different? Well, uh, it's an awful lot cheaper than uh, paying $10,000 to a boot camp. Um, it's self-paced, so you don't have to uh, fit all this in in three months and not work for three months and things like that. Um, and you can skip grades as well. You might find yourself doing grade one, find uh, find that uh, you, you, you have um, an ability at this and then next do grade four, then grade six, and then grade eight. Um, the important thing is, is that you're deciding when you're when you're taking the grades. Um, and code grades, rather than trying to, I don't know, fill your head with lots of information in the kind of cramming style that, 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 uh, that I've encountered from um, talking with graduates of boot camps. Um, uh, code grades is trying to create a sort of a scaffolding through the syllabus uh, for a more practical and um, complete grounding um, in both the practice and culture of software development, um, rather than here's everything you need to know about SQL databases. Um, and obviously you can't learn that in a week. Um, it takes a, a, a period of time for you to um, first encounter something, some aspect of coding, um, and then uh, you need to be able to make mistakes. You need to explore this. It takes time for your mind to sort of get its head around um, the particular ways in which different concepts fit together. And so uh, this is this is how co grades is different to the boot camps. The other way in which folks are famously helping people learn to code is uh, all the efforts that that we see around the world to um, to educate kids. Now this is obviously really very very good but um I, I want to tell you about a friend of mine uh, called dawn hewitson who is a professor at uh, one of the uh, at a university here in the uk and she trains teachers to teach computer science and we have a thing in the uk called ofsted the office for standards in education and they have rated dawn's course as the best course in the country for teacher training so dawn is um someone that i listen to and she has explained that um actually at this teaching kids to code level we have a huge and confusing range of beginner resources it's all, there are always some sort of variation of hello world or making an led blink or you know measuring the number of times a cat flap opens and closes and things like that but there's very little to do in the way of progression or upward momentum um, and the best you can do with all these resources is to move sideways from one beginner project to another and uh, what it means is that we have uh, what I like to call the uh, how to draw an owl problem I, I don't know if you've seen the cartoon um, but it's two frames uh, how to draw an owl the, f the first frame is draw two circles and the second frame is draw the rest of the damn owl and th these kids are stuck constantly in that first frame draw two circles draw two circles and what co-grade is trying to do is um what in the past has been called gradus ad parnassum which means steps to parnassus where parnassus is the uh is the, the hall of the greek gods really um, and uh, what you do, it, 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 it's steps to a higher level of understanding. Um, and so by having the grades, you're not going around in circles doing beginner stuff all the time. You have a sense of, well, there's the next thing that's going to lift me up. And there's a sense of moving upwards on a long and difficult climb, uh, but it's a well-supported climb to mastery. And uh, I don't know, we're going to parnass us. So godlike powers, that's what you're <laughs> uh, trying to get to. But um, that's that's the other way I would characterize how co-grades is, 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 is different. So yeah, that's how I guess co-grades is different to the current offerings of uh, of training folks to to code there are a few things that come out of that so one of the things you mentioned is the idea of these intensive boot camps where we have tried to take the standard educational model of sit a bunch of people in a room cram them full of knowledge and then test them at the end that has been so wildly successful in western education for so long and <laughs> then just trying to condense it down and so then there are also programs such as lambda school that try to get rid of the upfront cost of participating in that, but they still have a similar methodology of the professor at the front of the room teaching everybody. And then there are also challenges as far as self-paced education with people who are autodidacts, who teach themselves how to program, 
but there's always this gulf between, as you were saying, the beginner level information and then the expert level information where you're just sort of left to wander in the wilderness and hopefully someday you'll get out the other side. And I'm wondering how you're approaching the overall curriculum development to make sure that people are able to stay on a good path and have an entry point that is accessible to people at varying different levels, because that's often a challenge as well, where Hello World is too easy for some people and maybe just the right amount for other people, and then bring them along a progression that is going to work for a, a wide variety and largely curious about the structure of the curriculum, how you're approaching the development of that and any resources you're pulling on, and some of the challenges that you're facing in terms of how to structure that mid-level of content. That You're on fire. That's a really great question. I'm really pleased you asked it as well, because it really speaks to my uh, geeking out about education um, side of my personality, because this is something I find um, fascinating. So when it comes to how the curriculum, how the syllabus, sorry, is uh, structured. Uh, There are obviously the eight grades, uh, but within that, uh, I've subdivided the grade. Um, So the first two grades are essentially all about having fun and engaging with the process of learning to code, really. So it's not onerous to to be able to pass those grades, although there there are challenges involved. Um, But it's essentially all about welcoming people onto their journey about learning to code. Then grades three, four and five, I call the core grades, uh, because by the time you finished grade five, you have been introduced to pretty much most aspects of coding, but at a simple level. So for example, object orientation is uh, dealt with in grade five, but you're not expected to be uh, an extraordinary expert at object orientation, um, but you need to be able to demonstrate that you have some knowledge and uh, enough skill to be able to understand how to correctly apply that knowledge in a Python project that you are presenting to, uh, to a code mentor or assessor. And then Beyond grade five, grades six, seven, and eight, uh, these are the the extended enhanced grades. Um, in those grades, you revisit the stuff that you were doing in all the previous grades, um, but you are asked to do that in greater depth. So um, for example, in grade eight, let's talk about object orientation again. In grade eight, as a Python programmer, you will be expected to understand what Dunder methods are, and perhaps be able to talk about how Python has this notion of, uh, of, of protocols um, on objects. So if if an object quacks like a list um, and it uh, walks like a list, then it is a list and a duck typing and, uh, and understand how, well, where do we get this information from? Well, it's from a pep that's over here. I can tell you a little bit about it. So the, the three broad groups are introduction and having fun, getting a core, understanding of a good base of all the things that you need to know about and then refine 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 um so that you're eventually at a, the at a quite a competent level by the time you've done grade eight um and there, so for each grade there are core concepts in the syllabus which each candidate should demonstrate um for the grade that they're going for um, and these are cumulative um, and ordered in such a way that uh, getting mastery of the core concepts at the lower grades prepares you for the more advanced stuff uh, at the later grades. Um, and core concepts can be stuff like you understand uh, what a loop is and how to write one in Python or conditionals, for example. Or it might be something more abstract, like uh, you have some notion of logging. So you understand that there's a logging module. You understand there might be other choices about uh, how you might do logging, why you might log in the first place anyway that sort of stuff and here's a demonstration in my project i'm presenting of logging and this is why i'm logging these sorts of things um through to things like version control and uh, perhaps into uh interacting in a more social sense um, as a coder with uh, other projects understanding how to create a good pull request so that the person at the other end isn't bombarded with um with with just a spaghetti code <laughs> and, and and things like that um so the, the assessment 
of these core concepts is generally in, in, in three sorts of areas. Um, so we're assessing your coding, i.e. your knowledge of programming. You know, can you explain what a loop is and uh, things like that? Um, your creativity, how do you apply your knowledge in the projects that you present as part of your grading or as part of the pair programming task that happens during the grading? Um, and, and community uh, is, is the third um, sort of assessment criteria that we use. So do you... Uh, do you understand and see how what you're doing fits into the wider culture of programming? This is the, can I create a good pull request type uh, thing I'm talking about here. Um, and as as the grading takes place, uh, what happens? Well, uh, the, the, the code mentor, the person doing the assessment is filling in a form and that eventually turns into the feedback that the candidate gets at the end. So that sort of closes that sort of a loop. And actually, I just wanted to, to make one important point that by passing a grade you're also getting validation and this this is important because it's designed to be the antidote to imposter syndrome because what's happened when you achieve a grade well a professional coder has said that you are for, for instance grade five python and uh, it, this is somebody external to you has seen what you've be, what you can do and they said yes you can do this at the grade five level and there's nothing anyone else can do about it OK, um, and so it's a sort of an initiation into a particular sort of a level and it's evidence of a certain sort of achievement. And it gives you a sense of progress, a recognition of all the effort that you've put in. You feel pleased when you've passed. And it's a celebration of, uh, of your success in, in being able to successfully present a project and get useful feedback on it. There are a few things coming out of that. At the end, you were talking about the sense of achievement and accomplishment and the fact that you are receiving this grade and this level in the overall system. And one thing I'm wondering about is how you are thinking of approaching the idea of basically credentialing so that somebody can take their achievement in the code grade system and then show that to somebody else and then have that be a meaningful symbol for them to be able to gain some insight from. And then also there are the ideas of how the learning process takes place. So it's self-paced, but how do you keep people accountable? How do you keep them engaged? And how do you provide the necessary support structure and reference materials for them to be able to gain that level of achievement and understanding to be able to pass the grade? Those are great questions. So the first one is about recognition and the second one is about support. So I'll do one after the other. Um, so in terms of uh, recognition, um, <laughs> uh, unless you are the Queen of England, who can say by royal proclamation, uh, make it so, um, the only way that uh, people genuinely are, are, are going to see any value in, uh, in having a code grade for recognition is if other people start recognising code grades. Um, so it's a sort of a chicken and an egg situation. but I'm hopeful because once again, um, looking to the music world and you know belts in uh, in martial arts, um, those aren't um, mandated by say a government agency or something like that as an official um, qualification. It's just over a, a period of time, um, the culture of that particular group of people, martial artists or, or musicians, who have accepted this as a reliable measure. Of, um, of achievement and a record of, of, of attainment, as it were. Um, so the, the, the simple answer is that this is, this is hard to do um, and it will involve a culture change. And that's, um, I have to be honest, one of the risks about this um, is that if people, um, if people don't see any value in code grades, then, then we're sort of dead in the water, really. But then if people don't see any value in doing boot camps, after which you don't really get a certificate, I guess. It's not a formal qualification. You can just say, I've completed such and such a boot camp. Now give me a job. Um, I guess it's a similar sort of process as we've seen as uh, when boot camps have, have, have come on the scene. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. In, in that respect, I guess. And, and to turn to your second question, um, which is about how do you keep people engaged, how you keep people supported, um, where are the resources and things like that. Um, so I'm, I've done the code grading process two times now with different cohorts of people, and I keep iterating on um, 
on the process and learning from uh, from the mistakes um, that I've made and, and, and watching uh, what the candidates have been have been doing and, uh, and and trying to find out where the bumps in the road are for them. Now, um, the important aspect, the most important aspect that I can see is uh, keeping people enthused enough. Um, and this is why uh, I ask people to bring a project of their own choice, of their own making um, to the grading, um, so long as it can demonstrate the core concept at that particular grade, as it were. Um, because, of course, there's the famous hotel booking system that everybody gets set in an exam at some point in their career. Um, they have to solve problem. Nobody's really interested in that. But if you are trying to solve a problem that you care about, then you will have the wind in your sails, one would hope, when it comes to those tough times when you just can't see where the bug is in your code and the damn thing won't run. Um, you have the wind in your sails to be able to overcome that. But that's often not enough. So the way that I have been approaching preparing people for code grades is by doing it in a group, a small group. And this works very well because the candidates that we meet once a week, um, it's a very relaxed and informal um, way of meeting uh, as well. It's not like a class or anything. Uh, and it's more like a study group, really. And I act as a facilitator um, where I try and help people to come to the grade that they're going for in such a way that they're able to uh, get the energy and the information they need. So what I mean by that is it's not like I'm teaching a lesson. Today we're going to do conditionals or something like that. It's somebody will ask me a question, I will point them in the right direction, and then they'll go off and find um, their, their, their own solution to that particular problem to do with what they are doing to present in their grade. So what I've noticed, uh, and I'm kind of smiling to myself here, is because the second cohort of people that I've been working with has been a group of teenagers and their parents, all of whom are separately taking different grades. And it's been wonderful to see often the teenagers helping the adults out. And this is an important aspect of working together in a study group is that folks of different levels of attainment are able to help each other. And the, uh, and, and the people who are just starting out get to see it's all right to ask stupid questions or they're not stupid questions, but apparently stupid questions. Um, you know, uh, th th that person over there knows a lot about web development. So I know I can ask them about this sort of stuff. So I'm trying to create a place where every week somebody can come along and they can just feel that they're getting all the nourishment in an educational sense that they need. They're getting, they have people there who can point them in the right direction if they need help with particular problems. And um, I'm also asking folks to prepare presentations for next week. So they are researching what is it to do logging and they will practice explaining logging um, and therefore there's like a mini lesson happening in this group now here's where it gets interesting is that this process for co-grace to succeed needs to uh, be reproducible with not just me in the room and um, that's what the third cohort uh, that's going to be starting in September is all about and I imagine I guess in a similar way to how Django girls have a particular format of how a Django Girls Day happens, um, what I want to try and do is after the third cohort has gone through, is come up with a, here are here are some recipes for how you might organise your study group. Here's where you might be able to find the help that you need. There are online resources over here. We have our um, chat platform over there where you can ask questions and see what other candidates are up to so that you feel that you're joining a community that is helpful that has the um, support that you need to help you get through those bumps in the road when you find them. And because everybody's on that sort of a journey, there's that feeling of, well, you know, what grade are you going for? Well, I'm going for my grade five. Oh, that's really cool. I'm only going for my grade three, but you've got something in common. You're doing a common sort of journey, if you see what I mean. So I hope that answers your questions. That's two rather complicated answers, um, but that speaks to the complexity of the problem that, that I'm trying to address, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely like the approach that you're taking of it being a study group so that you're not trying to replicate the expert at the front of the room, trying to lead everybody along the same path and just letting everybody 
approach it in somewhat of an anarchic fashion and be able to find their own information at the pace and in the manner that suits them. Because I think that that's definitely the best way to be able to learn where you have the group for being able to lean on for support and to keep yourself accountable so that you don't just drop off and decide, oh, I'm not going to work on it this week because you have somebody expecting something from you at your next meeting but you're taking the carrot and not the stick approach. And I think that that's definitely great. And I appreciate what you were saying too, about being able to make your process repeatable so that, so that other people can pick it up. And as somebody who is interested in trying to start up my own uh, sort of code education group for my own community, I'm definitely curious to hear about your experiences and be able to try and use some of the materials that you're developing to experiment with it on my own. So uh, I, I like all of the what you're saying there. And then another thing that I'm curious about is the sort of base level of understanding that you're expecting for somebody coming in and what your approach is for being able to sort of test out of a certain grade without necessarily having to go through the preceding exercises. I'd like to add something to sort of complement what you were just talking about um, when you said about the study group. You know, you feel it, it, it's a place where you perhaps uh, it encourages you to keep turning up all the time. Um, to me, the study group is like the weekly rehearsal of the band or the choir or or going to the dojo once a week to, to meet the sensei and, and what have you. I mean, obviously, you practice outside of those situations, but there's always a point of contact. So um, I think what you say is, is 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 absolutely right. I think we're definitely on the on the same page there. Um, and so you asked about uh, what the expectations are for um those coming to programming for the first time and that's really interesting because what i've been doing <laughs> basically over the last i don't know five or six years is building tools for beginner programmers so the mu editor is a, a classic case uh in point um, so this is an editor specifically targeted at beginner programmers. This is what I use with the um, never programmed before level of uh, people who turn up um, as potential candidates for code grades. Uh, they can just download it, they install it, Python and everything they need is there. And then um, they can just start coding as quickly as possible. Um, I found that um, so many beginners, um, and I've seen this actually with, uh, with Django girls and I like the way that they've overcome this with their install party but um, so many folks um, just trying to get yourself set up with a development environment is so hard to do uh, and which is why Mew is is quite an important aspect of welcoming complete beginners into into this process I, I kind of try and imagine um, explaining to my dad who is a clever person but uh, a complete ignoramus when it comes to computers um, you know, how do you get this person um, into a working environment where they can start to engage with the educational resources and the educational activities that are going on to prepare you for your first grade? That's where something like Mew comes in. Um, when it comes to uh, judging where you are you, in the syllabus, I mean, obviously the syllabus is there. Uh, if you're unsure what, what you should do, then you should do grade one. And it will very quickly become apparent whether this is this is for you or you're working way beyond this. And in which case, um, my suggestion is try looking at grade two for a while. Um, and if that seems easy, go to grade three. And, and this is actually what happens. Again, I'm thinking of when I did karate quite a number of years ago. Uh, now, uh, you learn the kata, the particular patterns of movement for different belts and if you've done all the first belt ones in a matter of weeks then go on to the second belt third belt and so on and so forth i'm, I'm using numbers here because the colors are always different uh, they all end in black but they're always different order of colors uh, depending on which martial art that you're doing um so uh but basically you start at the beginning and you just find your level really and then you, you you get your grade and you know okay from now on i can start to see that the next grade by taking say grade four the requirements for grade five come into view over the horizon they no longer seem like the intimidating confusing thing that i don't know about anymore i have enough understanding and context by doing grade four that grade five uh is now achievable 
and so on and so forth until grade eight, you can look over your shoulder and go, wow, that's an awful lot of work I've managed to do over the however many years it might have taken, or maybe months if you're very good at this. What's left? Well, you have a portfolio of work. Um, you've got a support network of people who you've gone through the grading system with, and uh, you should have, over a period of time, been inducted into what it is to be an effective software developer. And you mentioned that for somebody who completes up through grade eight, that they should be facile with the various aspects of software engineering in a professional context, such as version control, pull requests, the basics of actually building applications and object orientation. And I'm just wondering if your expectation is that for somebody who does complete up through that grade eight, that they would then be in a situation where they could be hired on as an engineer and at what level they would expect to be brought into an organization where recognizing that junior versus mid versus senior is completely arbitrary depending on where you're landing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So for grade eight, grade eight is obviously like getting a black belt at karate and for for martial artists, that means you discover that you've got to the end of the beginning of your journey and you've managed to overcome the a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing problem. So I want it to feel like that for programmers who, who get their grade eight. They can see that they've achieved such a lot, but there's so much more to learn. They've perhaps acquired that humbleness that you need to be able to become an effective, autonomous learner. Because if you're a know-it-all, then you're blind to being able to acquire more skill and knowledge. Um, so um, in terms of the real world, what does that mean? Well, uh, I would judge uh, grade eight means that you'll be a good junior level coder who could immediately engage with any Python project they might find on GitHub. And by that, I mean that they know how to interact with the project so they, they can Git clone the repository, they'll create a virtual environment, they'll run the um, unit tests with a make command or something like that. Um, they know how to submit patches that contain well-designed and thought out code um, that includes unit tests, documentation, comments in the code, that sort of a thing. The important thing is, is that what we don't want to do is train a bunch of people to become a nuisance. <laughs> if you see what I mean, they, uh, the little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing problem um, where they turn up to a, a Python project and essentially go, well, I've got the solution to this without actually realizing that the people who've been working on this problem have uh, perhaps a, a greater level of detail uh, and depth and understanding of, of, of what the problem might be. So this is why I also tend to uh, accentuate the, the, the cultural aspect of this as well. The fact that being a, an effective soft de software developer is, is often having, um, how can I describe this? A, 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 well, a sense of humbleness, really. Um, you, you don't know what the answer is, uh, but you're exploring the problem space. Um, you, you can look at other people's work, or maybe you thought of an idea of how to solve this problem, but you're checking it all the time um, that this might be a good way to go forwards. That sort of a thing. So grade eight means you are effective as a software developer and a um, helpful enough member of the community that you're behaving in such a way that you are positively contributing to it. But perhaps most importantly, as a software developer yourself, you feel you have the knowledge and the perspective and the understanding of the community that you can build the projects that you are interested in, or you can engage with those projects that are doing stuff in the parts of software development that you're interested in. That, I guess, is the bottom line. And we've been talking this whole time with the understanding that the syllabus and the course material that you're working through is oriented around the Python language and its community. And that makes sense given your affiliation to the language and your engagement with the overall ecosystem of Python development and people who are working there. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the viability and the level of effort necessary to be able to translate this to other languages or other sort of sub-disciplines within engineering, whether that's systems administration, machine learning, graphic design, and just 
the overall idea of this being an applicable framework for education, both at the entry level, but also once you've achieved grade eight at the base framework, then uh, going forward to try and achieve grades in some of those other sub-disciplines? So that's a really great question, um, because it allows me to say that code grades is just one sort of a technique that I've borrowed from music. So I guess by the time you've got grade eight on your instrument, you've got your kind of core skills sorted out. You've overcome the little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing sort of thing. Um, And you understand that you've got a lot more to learn. And perhaps you have some notion of what it is that you want to specialize in or or get into. Um, As a software developer, you might say, I'm going to do data science or machine learning or games development or or web programming or something like that. Uh, In in music, we have a similar sort of thing is that you, you get good at your instrument and then you might want to specialize as a cellist in baroque music or as a brass player in, in brass bands or, um, as a wind player, as a soloist, or um, playing in chamber music, the, the, you know the, the music world is is a is a complicated, diverse, huge sort of world to exist in. And so, the, the notion of grades kind of stops there. So, I guess my answer to you would be: if you would like to acquire a new base language, then if using the way code grades works with Python, and that is shown to be a success, if we use that as a template, I can't see there being any reason why you couldn't do that with, for example, JavaScript or Ruby or something like that. However, I would say that Python is particularly suitable for working with beginners because of its relatively simple and uncluttered syntax and the fact that you use white space to um to to define code blocks and things like that means that it's easy to read so accessibility when it comes to python is and beginner programmers is 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 a win there although other programming languages could be used um and it would be interesting to see if that is in fact the case so that i guess is like saying um i've made a, a grading system for brass players but now the wind players and the string players and the keyboard players and the electric guitar players and the drummers all want to get involved and have their own grade system. But then the other things in the wider community, the system administration, the statistics, the graphical design, the the machine learning sort of stuff, that feels like stuff that you do after you've got your grade eight. And the way musicians do that is they, well, they have masterclasses for a start. Um, where you will have an acknowledged expert will come along and um, students will prepare at the particular level they are at, a concerto or something or other in the discipline that this person is an expert on, and they do it in public as well. So I remember when I was at music college going along to masterclasses, they're terrifying because you are sat in front of your peers um, and you're playing to uh, usually a world famous musician at that sort of a level. Um, And they take you apart. Um, And I don't mean that in a nasty way. I mean, they are finding ways in which they can help you, support you and so on and so forth, as well as giving you constructive criticism. Um, The important thing is that because everybody is sat in the room, um, then everybody gets the benefit from these pearls of wisdom. Now, this reminds me a little bit like PyData meetups. Um, where folks have perhaps that baseline of Python knowledge. They want to get into Python data science. Um, what will you get? You'll get people giving talks or maybe workshops on on, 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 on data uh, analysis, um, data science, statistics, or, or machine learning or something in a PyData meetup. Um, and that feels to me very much similar to the sort of masterclass uh, type thing that, um, that, that musicians do. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes. And then in terms of your experiences so far and your efforts and uh, your work that you've done with some of these study groups, I'm wondering what you have found to be particularly interesting or exciting or unexpected outcomes that you've observed and lessons that you've learned in the process. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the perhaps the most wonderful aspect of this is um, watching folks as they're preparing for their grade because they are investing themselves in a particular coding project, which is something that they're quite passionate about because it's something that interests them. 
And so they really get into it. And there's a sort of an energy involved in that. It, it, I, I've seen on a couple of occasions, I've only done this with, you know, small cohorts so far, uh, but some of the people in the room, they'll, they'll, they'll get their thing working and you know how it is. You go, wow, I could add this other feature though. Um, and they, they start to explore the problem space more and they start to refine the thing that they're going to present. And, and, and this is a wonderful thing to see because it's also another sort of learning opportunity. And then the outcome is always, or has been so far, always, they feel extraordinarily nervous when it comes to the grading. Um, and it's very similar, actually, to the way music grades work. You know, there's a sort of dentist's waiting room type vibe before they go in. Um, then they go in and the, sort of the nerves fall away and you're just focused on presenting your project and doing the pair programming task. Um, and uh, so far, I've always been outside ready to kind of do a debrief with these folks. And they come out and the first thing they always do, guaranteed, is they kind of wipe their forehead and go, whew, I'm pleased that's over. And they grin because it was a genuinely a, a, a sort of a positive sort of way of framing that. Um, and then for the next 30 seconds to a minute, they'll say things, oh, but I forgot to tell them about blah, 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 blah. Or I didn't mention such and such thing. Or oh, I forgot what the uh, function signature was for such and such thing when we were pair programming and things like that. So they kind of remember all the mistakes or all the things they could have done better. But then they go, but... Um, but the actual presentation went well. Uh, they liked the game that I made or the project that they made, um, blah, 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 blah. And they remember, actually, that there's more positive stuff that happened, okay, um, in, in, the, in, in the grading process. And generally, they feel, I'm pleased I did that. When can I do it again? That was a really fun aspect of the first cohort is that all of them said that they wanted to do another code grade because they'd had such a positive experience of it. So this bodes well. So um, that, for me, is the positive that, that I keep hold of when, uh, when I'm looking at my laptop thinking in an evening, oh, gosh, right, OK, so what he's doing on code grades? <laughs> so far, we've been focusing on the learner side of the equation of how they progress through the different grades and how they pursue their education. But there's also, as you mentioned, the mentoring side and the evaluation side. And I'm wondering what you have established as criteria for a good mentor and evaluator for the students who are trying to achieve their code grades and what's involved in uh, getting involved in your efforts as a mentor and becoming part of your network? Okay, so th this is an extraordinarily important aspect of the project. Um, so up front, I need to say that uh, to become a code mentor, you need to be a, well, how do you explain, a good uh, developer. How do we know that you're a good developer? Well, it's because we can see evidence that you are displaying the sorts of behavior, the sorts of code, the sorts of uh, community interaction that um, that one would expect from somebody working in a mentorship uh, position uh, within the community. So there's that. Secondly, there's the whole piece about ensuring that uh, given different mentors assessing, for example, the same person, the same candidate, sorry, they will give similar enough marks that the person gets the same sort of feedback. So there is a consistency between the mentors as they are assessing similar sorts of candidates, but also similar across time um, as well, so that the same code mentor doesn't go sort of easy on people as they get older, as it were. So part of the training to be a mentor and training would be offered uh, is, um, is how to do effective assessment. Uh, and that's actually quite a skill. Now, when I trained to be a teacher, we spend an awful lot of time um, looking at the way uh, you could go about assessments. But essentially, it's something that, uh, that that you can practice and it's a skill that you can get better at. And part of the training for being a code mentor is to do lots of, uh, well, not lots, but a number of dummy um, assessments that you compare against uh, other folks so that you can see, well, actually, was I too hard on this? Am I thinking about the right sorts of things when I'm assessing? That sort of thing. And the third aspect of this is that the assessment happens um, on a, well, it's a Django based website that uh, that uh, I'm currently building at the moment. Um, 
but the the assessment form is a uh, is a guided process really uh, for want of a better word um so as uh, as the assessment unfolds in real time you'll be able to um select certain things uh, certain sentences certain um levels from um, available options and uh, and and you'll give an opportunity to be able to write um sort of free form uh, feedback uh, so that by the end of the 20 minutes or an hour or however long it takes depending on the level of the grade um the uh, the end result for the candidate is uh, is a pdf with uh, feedback saying things like um you know your pair programming was strong because you did this 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 and this um and uh there's some feedback about i liked it when you asked questions about such and such it showed that you had the depth to understand that uh, there was more to this problem than perhaps met the eye at uh, first met the eye that sort of stuff um so it's an interesting problem and I hope that for those developers who are interested in in doing the sort of code mentorship, the sorts of skills that you need to develop to become an effective code mentor are also the skills that you need to uh, become an effective, how can I put it, um, uh, project leader, for example. You are going to have to give people feedback about their pull requests. You are going to have to tell somebody who has perhaps presented spaghetti code that they need to rethink their approach. You need to uh, be able to uh, pair program or very quickly assess um, the quality of, of, of code that, that, that's going on here. So uh, I hope in that sense, uh, it's an appealing prospect. The fact that obviously the only thing that people pay for is the grading and uh, a large part of that is passed on to the person doing the, the assessment. Um, so uh, I hope that it would be appealing as uh, perhaps a solution to that eternal question of how do you fund open source software developers who give away <laughs> the fruits of their labours for, uh, for, for no money um, uh, under a liberal MIT or GPL type licence. So it might go some way to addressing that. But right now, what I'm doing is working with a, a small group of uh, people, professional Python developers that I know through virtue of the fact that I'm a Python software developer, and I'm working with them uh, to to work out the whole uh, mentor story, as it were, uh, getting their feedback. Um, some of them are doing uh, some of the assessments with the cohorts that are coming through, giving me feedback about that. Um, and in, in the same way, as you said, there are two parts to this story. Um, I'm constantly trying to refine what's happening for the candidates. It's a similar sort of story for the, the folks that are um, acting as, as mentors as well. So looking forward to the future of code grades in the medium to long term, what are the goals that you have set for yourself and what are the challenges that you anticipate and that you're actively planning for and just any other thoughts that you have on your experiences so far? <laughs> the end goal is very simple and that is for code grades to become sustainable and useful and a positive contributor to the wider software development community in the same way that music grades um, are for the music world. It's a complicated project. There are lots of ways in which it can go wrong. There are lots of things that need to happen to make it go right. So the biggest challenge I have is just trying to make that happen, really. Soon, in the autumn, fall in America, I'll be publishing the syllabus publicly. Um, at the moment, it's being reviewed uh, by the folks helping me with the mentorship side of things. And uh, I'm going to be publishing the website with more details of the process um, that I'm currently testing with the candidates. So um, over the winter month, um, I hope to be able to get lots of open feedback, as it were. I hope that sometime in the new year to start um, actually properly recruiting senior level engineers who are interested in getting paid uh, to give back to the community uh, by evaluating candidates. And well, we'll see what happens at that point, really. But uh, it's hard to tell. It's, uh, what can I say? Um, we'll just have to wait and see <laughs> is the best I can do. Uh, I'm hopeful and positive about what I've managed to achieve so far about the direction of travel 
that co-grades is going in, but it, it's uh, small steps um, over a long period of time, building up, building up, building up, building up, and eventually perhaps there might be a tipping point and it can become sustainable. Uh, that is the long-term goal, uh, but because this involves humans um, and it's a human rather than a technical problem, uh, it's not as if I'm sort of making widgets here. Uh, there's a, a, an awful lot of investment of person time, as it were, um, working with people and, and helping them um, get to the place they need to to become effective candidates or effective mentors. Um, so I guess time is the thing that uh, I, I most require. <laughs> is there any other way that people who are listening to this podcast can help in terms of growing the community of people that are part of this project or any other contributions that they can make to help you in your endeavors? Okay, so they can make themselves known to me, really. Um, so drop me an email or go to the codegrades.com uh, uh, website uh, where you'll be able to sign um, uh, s uh, sign up via a form, and um, as like I say, over the autumn, winter, new year, things start to happen. Uh, I'll be getting in touch with the folks who've expressed an interest um, to see uh, how they engage, invite them to to provide feedback, um, invite them to take part in various activities, um, just so that. I can start to uh, to to test the the work that's uh, that, that's gone on so far and, and and see how it works in a wider context. If it goes well, then we can open it up and uh, to to more people and um, hopefully have a, a a good pipeline of candidates and mentors uh, to help support them. Uh, it's also important to point out, by the way, is that. Uh, um, by becoming a mentor, um, one of the, I guess, responsibilities uh, or things that you would be invited to do would be to help continue the development of CodeGrades itself as well. So it, it, it's not just a case of here's a thing, it's finished, now go do your mentoring. It's a case of uh, here's a thing, it's unfinished, we're a community here, can we work out how we can improve it? You're a mentor. Uh, you know coding, you know what it's like to mentor people or to uh, to assess people. We'd love to hear your feedback. So in a sense, we're following the kind of open source um, community development um, model here as well. Are there any other aspects of your work on the CodeGrades platform itself and growing the community or your thoughts on software education in general that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? Yes, actually, something that's happened in the last... I don't know, three or four weeks, really. Um, the, the second cohort of uh, candidates that I've been working with, the, the teenagers and their parents, um, one of the things that I noticed is that many of them wanted to create uh, Python applications that had a graphical user interface. Now, if you're doing grade one, two, or three, some of the lower grades, you don't have the programming chops to perhaps engage with <laughs> uh, PyQt or TKinter or PyGTK or some other horrendous um, uh, <laughs> user interface kind of framework um, that might be easy if you're a, um, an experienced developer, but uh, in order to be able to use them effectively, you need to actually know quite a lot about how computers work, how software is put together and things like that. Um, so I... I saw that there was a need for some sort of a solution for how do we make graphical user interfaces with beginners. And at about the same time, Adafruit, the folks who make those wonderful um, uh, boards uh, that run their variant of MicroPython called CircuitPython, um, they uh, have a, a device called a Pi Portal, which is a Python device that has a touch screen attached to it. It's rather cool. And they used a hypercard style of organizing their user interfaces, the best I can put it. They used the example of a choose your own adventure game. If you remember those from the 1980s, um, you know, you are in a sort of a, a room full of twisty passages. Turn to page seven if you'd like to go left, page 93 if you want to go right or or page two if you want to go down, that sort of thing. And um what would happen is that uh, there would be presented some buttons. You press the button, it would transition you to the next card in the application stack. And I realized that uh, this would be a really great way of helping beginner programmers um, figure out how to create 
a simple graphical user interface led pieces of software. So this last two weeks, I've been working on um, just such a library. It's called PiperCard, as in it's like HyperCard, but it's Pythonic. So that's P-Y-P-E-R card, Piper card. Um, and so I'm looking for folks to uh, take a look at it and give feedback, please. That would be rather helpful. Thank you. <laughs> well, for anybody who does want to get in touch and contribute to your various projects and efforts and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And so with that, I'm going to move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose the Parsi library. I've been experimenting with that lately for a simple little script on my own time, and it's been quite pleasant to use. Uh, so definitely recommend that for anybody who's looking to put together some simple parsing logic. And I'm also going to pick the book Nevermore, The Trials of Morgan Crow. I'm about halfway through that with my older son, and it's been a great book. A uh, lot of really interesting ideas and concepts built into that. Uh, it's hard to summarize the plot effectively, but if you're looking for a good book to read, I definitely recommend picking that up. And so with that, I'll pass it to you, Nicholas. Do you have any picks this week? The, the Piper Card project that I mentioned earlier, uh, I built that on top of the Kivi library, which isn't perhaps that well known, but it's um, it's a cross-platform Python um, user interface come game development uh, platform. And the reason that I started looking into this is that not only does it work on Windows, iOS, um, yeah, OS 10 and Linux, it also runs on Android and iOS. So it targets mobile devices. And this is the next thing I'm going to do is, is have a look at trying to get the, the Piper card projects working on my mobile phone and tablets and things like that. And when it comes for written suggestions, um, I'm going to suggest two, if you don't mind. Um, the first one is uh, a biography of the philosopher <laughs> Ludwig Wittgenstein by um, by another philosopher called Ray Monk. Uh, Wittgenstein, the duty of genius, it's called. Um, now, I, I imagine your listeners sort of holding their, their heads in their hands going, oh God, this sounds terrible. Uh, but really, it's a very readable uh, biography. And Wittgenstein was a fascinating man. Um, I especially like the chapter that describes the discussions Wittgenstein was having with Alan Turing about the fundamental nature of mathematics, um, the, the fundamentals of the nature of mathematics and logic and things. That was uh, that was really, really very interesting and the sort of thing that would appeal to um, geeky programmers who, who like their kind of uh, maths and logic. The second one is uh, a, a, an old chestnut, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. My 11-year-old son, is reading it at the moment and he's laughing out loud at different sections and he's sending to the family whatsapp group particular quotes and things like that but the reason i'm mentioning it is that i love the sense of optimism about how useful some sorts of technology can be in a playful sort of a way but i also like the way douglas adams is completely cynical about the way technology can be used in the wrong sort of way. And I'm thinking about the way the doors open and close on the uh, spaceship um, with an artificial intelligence that uh, everybody loathes. Um, this reminds me of certain um, ways in which the web has developed. <laughs> Yeah, I'll definitely second the recommendation for The Hitchhiker's Guide. That's a great series that I've read a couple of times, and I'm looking forward to reading that with my children as well. So thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and discuss your experiences and efforts in building the Code Grades platform and network. I'm very excited to see how that plays out in the future, and I look forward to you releasing the syllabus so that I can try it out with my own kids and with the group that I'm looking to start up in my area. So thank you for all of your efforts on that front and in helping to produce and drive forward the efforts of education in the Python community. And so I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. It's been, uh, it's been great to be here.